Uh, today, we'll start by talking about the issue of risk. Uh, Bermuda is a critical global hub of insurance and risk management. And thinking about risk in the privacy context has the potential to become the universal language of this assembly. Uh, so to speak further about these issues, I'm delighted to welcome to the stage uh, Suzanne Williams-Charles of the Association of Bermuda Insurers and Reinsurers. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Good morning, everyone. Um, good morning to those that are streaming in. Good morning to those in the room, and welcome to Bermuda. Um, as Alex mentioned, I'm Suzanne Williams-Charles, and I am the Dep Director of Policy and Regulation for the Association of Bermuda Insurers and Reinsurers, um, or ABIR. And ABIR is a trade association that represents the policy interests of um, global reinsurers that are domiciled um, in Bermuda and operate out of Bermuda, and we represent their policy interests globally. Um, and we've spent a lot of time over the last couple of years with Alex, which I'll talk about in, in my brief um, comments. Um, so the first panel this morning is going to explore the balance required by data protection authorities and organizations that use data in order to accomplish their respective missions while protecting the rights of individuals. And before the panel moves into their discussions on risk, it's only fitting that you hear about, a bit about Bermuda, um, who's also um, referred to as the world's risk capital. Um, the importance of data privacy to the reinsurance industry will also be discussed, and the importance of a strong framework for data protection to Bermuda's reputation as a leading financial center. So the insurance industry in Bermuda has undergone um, a remarkable evolution over the past 40 years or so, and more recently in the last 20 years, transforming from a relatively small local market to a global insurance and reinsurance hub. Beginning in the mid-20th century, Bermuda attracted international insurers and reinsurers leading to the establishment of numerous sophisticated and innovative companies. When speaking of risk in Bermuda, one's mind immediately goes to the reinsurance industry, which is an industry which, as an industry, is the largest economic driver for the country. Reinsurance is a risk management tool used by insurance companies to mitigate their own risk, and it involves the transfer of a portion of the risk from an insurance company to a reinsurance company. And this process essentially helps ensure companies protect their financial stability and ensure that they are there to cover large, or unexpected claims. So, so Hurricane Andrew is really the pivotal point for Bermuda, um, which struck in 1992, um, and it shaped Bermuda's reinsurance industry, essentially. Hurricane Andrew was one of the costliest and most de devastating hurricanes in US history, particularly affecting Florida and Louisiana. It resulted in massive insurance losses, especially in property and casualty lines, and the insurance industry faced substantial financial strain during, due to the extensive damage. In the wake of Hurricane Andrew, insurance companies faced the need for greater protection against catastrophic losses. They sought to transfer some of the risk associated with such events to reinsurers to ensure their financial stability and capacity to underwrite policies. Many insurance and reinsurance companies set up operations in Bermuda to provide catastrophe reinsurance and other specialized coverage. Hurricane Andrew's legacy on Bermuda's reinsurance market is substantial. Bermuda remains a key player in the global catastrophe reinsurance and risk transfer landscape, demonstrating its resilience and adaptability in the face of catastrophic events. Bermuda's insurance sector has thrived due to its adaptability, resilience, and ability to attract top talent and capital, making it a prominent and influential player in the global insurance arena. Bermuda's status as a world-class financial center is a result of a combination of factors that make it an attractive place for international financial business to operate and serve clients worldwide. Bermuda has earned a reputation as a world-class financial center and a prominent international financial hub, primarily due to its stable political environment, sound regulatory policies, and well-established financial services industry. Data privacy is crucial for reinsurance companies because, amongst other things, it is essential for maintaining trust and reputation, protecting confidential information, enabling data sharing and collaboration, and fulfilling ethical responsibilities. Prioritizing data privacy safeguards the interests of both the reinsurance company and its clients while ensuring the industry's integrity and sustainability. As I'm sure many of you know, in 2016, Bermuda passed the Personal Information Protection Act 2016, and in 2020, upon the appointment of the Privacy Commissioner, ABIR determined it critical to ensure we focused on providing a mechanism to support our member companies through their journey to compliance, and also to ensure we provided the Privacy Commissioner here in Bermuda with relevant data regarding the reinsurance sector to facilitate implementation. 
In 2021, ABIR established the ABIR Data Privacy Task Force, primarily to support the mission goals, missions and goals of the Privacy Commissioner and establish a communication link between the Privacy Commissioner um, and a key stakeholder group. This communication link was critical to ensure that, what, that there was a mechanism to provide feedback on the likely impact of the, of the impact of PIPA when applied to the reinsurance sector and to determine that the well-established data privacy standards such as GDPR were also considered when that framework was implemented. Many of our members have global operations and the continuity of the implementation of PIPA with other, the consideration of others' um, standards was very important to our membership. I will now hand the stage and the microphone over to Trevor Hughes and this distinguished panel to discuss data privacy and risk in more depth. Thank you. Well, good morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning. It is lovely to see such a packed room. There's seats up front. If any of you can't find seats in the back, please do move up. There are some empty seats up here. I uh, know we truly are uh, delighted to be here today to, um, uh, to talk about risk, an issue so central to data protection and privacy around the world, an issue that is so prominent as we navigate a new AI present and future. Uh, and we have an esteemed panel joining us today to explore that issue. And let me um, just tell you a little bit about our format today, and then I will introduce our panel. We're going to have introductory statements. We have a number of questions. We're going to have a dialogue briefly about uh, a number of issues that exist as we think about risk and data protection, risk and AI, risk and how we actually navigate and use the tools and the resources necessary to assess, mitigate, manage risk um, uh, within organizations, within data protection authorities. Uh, we do have time for questions throughout. And so if you have a question, um, I would be happy to uh, recognize you at any of these microphones. So if you do have a question at any point uh, during the session, please do uh, join us. And I can see some of you shifting in your seats already. Let us get started just for a bit. Um, and then we'll be happy to recognize uh, uh, people at the microphones for questions. And OK, without further ado, let us dive in. I'm going to introduce our panel. Uh, from the far end coming towards me, um, uh, Marga España is the director of the Spanish Data Protection Authority. We are very happy to have her joining. Welcome, Mar. It's yeah. great to have you. Um, uh, next to uh, Mar is Anu Talus, who is the commissioner for the Finnish Data Protection Authority. She is also the chair of the European Data Protection Board. Welcome, Anu. It's great to have you. Emma Martins is the Data Protection Commissioner for Guernsey, another beautiful island in the Atlantic. Welcome, Emma. It's great to have you here. Uh, and last but not least is Naomi Lefkowitz, who is the Senior Privacy Policy Advisor in the Information Tech Lab at the National Institute of Standards and Technology uh, in the US Department of Commerce, NIST, as we all know and love it. Welcome, Naomi. It's great to have you here. I will mention that Mar will be speaking in Spanish today. So if you would like to get a translator set, by all means, please do. Um, and with that, why don't we start with opening statements? And we'll start immediately to my right with Naomi. Great. Thank you. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. So um, as Trevor mentioned, NIST is part of the US Department of Commerce, uh, but you could often people think of us as the uh, national measurement laboratory. So we are sort of the measurement laboratory for the United States. Um, and it's always important, especially in this environment, to mention that we are non-regulatory. So we sort of play this role in the middle of you know, trying to use science for measurement and uh, produce guidance and tools and frameworks um, based on that research. Uh, so, and Trevor also mentioned that uh, I'm actually sit in the information technology lab. I lead our privacy engineering program. Uh, and so our goal in the information technology lab is to you know, increase the trustworthiness of information technologies, not surprisingly. 
Uh, <clears throat> so when we established the privacy engineering program, um, you know, a, we wanted to provide in that space, you know, more frameworks, tools, guidance uh, to help organizations um, understand how to do privacy risk management, which at the time, um, you know, many people were still saying you can't do privacy risk management, right? It's just there are the laws and that's what you do. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, we could see that organizations were struggling because you know, laws provide high level uh, kind of, uh, you know, even, even in prescriptive laws, you know, even with requirements, they're, they're somewhat high level and every organization has to figure out how to implement that in their particular environment. And so that's really where uh, risk management um, comes in. And so we, you know, we really didn't have a lot uh, to go on in privacy risk management. So we looked to cybersecurity as a model to try to understand, um, you know, how did they develop all these technologies and guidance and standards, um, and how could we do that for privacy? And what we looked at was that, you know, and I heard this question on uh, Monday night, which was, you know, what is privacy risk? Like, how do we do that? And so we had to create a model, um, because if you ask anyone in security, like, how do you assess risk? They all have a consistent model. They've long agreed that, you know, What's the likelihood that a threat will exploit a vulnerability, and you know the you know the impact if that occurs? And um, and so we thought, well, how do you do that in data processing, right? And as we heard, um, you know, this is data processing is being done for uh, you know mission and business purposes, and you know so. Is that the threat? Is the organization, what they're doing, the threat? Um, and so what we saw was, you know, how do you figure out when does your operation and data processing, when does that sort of tip over into creating some kind of problem or harm for, uh, you know, individuals or groups or, or a society? Um, and so that was the basis of the model. So what's the likelihood we said of a problematic data action um, and you know what's the impact if that occurs and all of a sudden now we have a way to analyze systems uh, and 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 like the security model the cybersecurity model you know you can put any input into threat right there are various kinds of threats and some of them will be more relevant in certain environments than others and so we can say you can input any kind of problem into a problematic data action and so you could do embarrassment you could do emotional distress you could do loss of self determination you could do discrimination you know any any problem that is relevant we can identify those problems you can put that into the model uh, and so, and the, the, the other main construct that we saw with uh, cybersecurity was that they had sort of system design objectives like confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And we wondered if we could come up with a set that was complementary. And so we created predictability, manageability, and disassociability to help engineers think about what are the capabilities that I need in my system. And we've seen those work as well. So with those sort of foundational constructs, we've been able to build upon those and uh, integrate privacy guidance into our cybersecurity guidance documents, uh, our publications, develop the NIST privacy framework. Um, we developed a privacy risk assessment methodology, which is a set of worksheets to actually assess the systems. And we saw the power of that to help organizations communicate um, the sort of story of privacy risk. So while security is there saying, hey, we've got this vulnerability, it's bad, we've got to adjust it, you know, privacy was sitting there saying, privacy is value that's very important. That's, you know, when it comes to giving out resources, like which story wins? <laughs> so now we could say, hey, when we do this, we're going to create embarrassment for our customers and they're not going to be happy or, you know, what have you. And now there was a story that could get resources. Um, and we saw the power of that codification. Um, and also, you know, we were giving grants and we, so in a sense, we almost sat as regulators, right, regulators of their money. Um, and we saw that they would come to us and they'd say, well, we used your, your tool and here are the risks we identified. And most importantly, you know, risk identification is just the start. 
then you get into the conversation about what should we do about that risk. Um, and that's where security really took off in terms of using technologies and policies to help manage those risks. And, and so you know, they said, well, here's our risk, and we think that risk doesn't merit this very expensive technology. And you know, we were like, well, you have a point. <laughs> right? And so we could have a conversation um, about like what was the best way to address that risk. Um, but at the same time, it's also helping us to spur research into privacy enhancing technologies, which sort of brings us to today. And, and, you know, and, and so we have these frameworks and tools and you know, now we're really trying to move into evaluation metrics for privacy enhancing technologies and increase their adoption. And so those are the various efforts that we are taking at NIST today. Fantastic. So lots more to get into there, but let's get through our introductory statements. Emma, please introduce yourself. Uh, Emma Martins, Data Protection Commissioner Guernsey. Um, and firstly, I want to say thank you to Alex and the team for such a warm welcome. Um, to see where you've come from and where you are now, Alex, makes us all in this community very proud. So well done to you and the team. Um, I mean, as a regulator for a small jurisdiction, just to be clear, we, we have our own legislation, but we are essentially um, considered adequate for the purpose of the GDPR, so we're very closely aligned uh, geographically as well as uh, from a legal perspective to the standards there. And risk um, is something that exercises data protection regulators a lot and always has done, and, and rightly so. And I would like to say, I think language is really important here as well. I think we need to talk about risk in the context of harms uh, and vulnerabilities and explore all of those things. It's, risk is not just one thing. Um, and data protection law is very familiar with all of those things. It's a language that we're all very familiar with. And lots of those elements are, are deeply embedded in, in the legislation itself. I mean, our, our legislation in Guernsey is, is very similar to GDPR, so I speak in, if, in that context. You know, we've got the protection of rights really fundamental here um, and the risks when those rights aren't upheld or aren't respected. You've got controllers' responsibilities um, you know, embedded is the accountability. And that gets to the heart of risk assessments, I think, and, and vulnerability assessments. Um, DPIAs, the requirement around DPIAs for controllers, um, the requirements around high-risk processing, particularly. Um, data protection officers, you need to think about all of these things when you're recruiting and whether you need one or not. And importantly, in the assessment of breaches by the controller, they need to work out what the impact of those breaches is or may be in the future. And of course, the law specifically talks about those groups of people and the characteristics that, they, that the law considers to be of greater risk, particularly children in GDPR uh, and our own legislation. And it also gives a special category data, which I know we'll all be familiar with that term. So the law is essentially saying this type of information, these type of people are riskier if you're handling that. And then from the regulator's perspective, you know, we've got uh, breach and complaint handling. You know, how we uh, look at those, I'll come on to talk about that again a little bit later, I hope. And in, in the consideration of sanctions, we need to be considering these things carefully. And of course, there is a statutory duty around um, making sure that children are protected. Um, and, and I do want just, just to, to finish the, this, uh, this comment here, is to say that when we talk about risk assessments, and we've heard the complexity of it from just now from Naomi, but we talk about risk, we talk about risk assessments, we talk about risk-based approaches, and it sounds so straightforward. It sounds something that's so easy to deliver. Um, and I know we'll go on to explore some of these questions, but actually, I think in the context of today's world, the fourth industrial revolution, that you know, we're immersed in data, I think we need to reconceptualize what we mean by it. I think we need to re rethink how we respond to it. Fascinating, fascinating. So lots to discuss, um, for sure. Um, Commissioner Talus, please. Well, uh, thank you, and uh, good morning. And um, thank you for the invitation uh, for this uh, panel. Uh, just to start uh, shortly with the uh, introduction, uh, I was uh, elected for the EDPB chair this May, so uh, some months ago, um, but uh, I am also the Finnish uh, Information Commissioner. I've held that post for some years now, um, but I'm not new to data protection. Um, this is uh, actually something I've done uh, quite a long time. I, for example, uh, uh, did the GDPR negotiations for the Finnish government. So I have a, I have a long background uh, into data protection. And then uh, going uh, to, to our, uh, the topic of today, we are talking about risk. 
and of course, uh, now <clears throat> I already mentioned the GDPR negotiations. So one of the one of the uh, underlying uh, um, features of the GDPR uh, was that it's a risk uh, it's a risk based approach, and this is I think uh, very much what we will uh, discuss here uh, today. So the GDPR builds on a risk based approach. And now we very often face uh, the question that what does this actually mean? What does the risk-based approach uh, ac actually mean? Because uh, we, cannot, uh, we cannot assess uh, how, to, how to protect fundamental rights. And this part uh, is, of course, uh, uh, correct. Uh, the fundamental rights are uh, not uh, modulated. Uh, they, they are not uh, negotiable. But then there are the second part, which is, uh, which is uh, <coughs> how you... Um, uh, apply the technical solutions to, to protect uh, the fundamental rights. And this is uh, where we need to find the balance, and this is, uh, this is uh, in the core of the risk-based uh, approach. Uh, what we do uh, as uh, EDBB uh, uh, to, to, uh, um, to promote uh, also this, uh, this, uh, this approach, uh, is that we, for example, provide uh, guidance uh, for the companies uh, to enable the companies to uh, assess uh, their risks uh, in accordance with the, uh, with the, with the aims uh, the data processing uh, involves. Uh, so uh, <coughs> this is, uh, this is uh, one of the uh, examples, but uh, I think that we can then get uh, in more detail to these uh, questions a little bit later. Absolutely. So uh, definitely much to discuss about the tension, the balance, the, the relationship between fundamental rights and risk-based approaches. I think there is quite a lot there, and we will get into that. Um, uh, last but not least for introductions, Commissioner Marta España. Uh, thank you very much. Of course. And uh, welcome and good morning to everybody. Uh, I'm sorry, but I will change. Uh, the Spanish is the second most spoken language in the world, and I will thank uh, the translator for their help. So if you don't have the headphones, uh, it's time to go for that. Um, eh, yo soy responsable de la Agencia Española de Protección de Datos desde hace más de ocho años. Y um, uno de, las, de los ejes transversales en los que eh, he intentado ¿no? transmitir a lo largo de estos ocho años ha sido que esa proactividad que el Reglamento General de Protección de Datos tras, eh, obliga a los responsables públicos y privados deberíamos ajustarlo también en el ámbito de los reguladores. Y desde hace años estamos trabajando en temas tan importantes como la responsabilidad social de la Agencia Española de Protección de Datos para ayudar, facilitar y acompañar a los responsables públicos y privados en este análisis de riesgos. Hace ocho años creé la División de Innovación Tecnológica, el responsable está aquí, Luz de Salvador, y hemos puesto a disposición de los responsables y encargados unas herramientas muy potentes que han supuesto el beneficio de más de 100.000 personas. Desde Facilita, otra herramienta que hay específica de análisis de riesgo y otra sobre evaluación de impacto, donde hemos identificado más de 173 riesgos. Eso no quiere decir que estén todos, pero por lo menos es una buena base sobre la que empezar a evaluar. Y ha supuesto una gran ayuda. Estas herramientas están traducidas al inglés y disponibles de forma gratuita para cualquier autoridad que forme parte de la conferencia internacional. Y quiero hacer también hincapié en que hablar de riesgos no es hablar solo de seguridad. Un riesgo puede ser para una empresa de Internet el no utilizar una base jurídica adecuada en el marco del artículo 6 del Reglamento General de Protección de Datos, por ejemplo. Y como es una intervención breve, quiero destacar dos temas especiales que a mí me preocupan especialmente y donde creo que como humanidad, como planeta, en un mundo global, en un mundo digital, nos estamos jugando muchísimo. Uno es el acceso por parte de los menores a las nuevas tecnologías, a Internet. En nuestro país los datos son preocupantes y creo que en Estados Unidos y en otros países también los menores están accediendo a contenidos inadecuados desde que se les regala el primer móvil con 8, 9, 10 años y en muchas ocasiones eso implica el acceso inmediato a la pornografía, a contenidos violentos en una etapa que es clave en su desarrollo cerebral y en el desarrollo de la empatía. 
Los servicios de salud están preocupados por los daños que esto está provocando en la salud mental. Soy consciente que en Estados Unidos, por ejemplo, se han interpuesto algunas demandas contra las, la, las redes sociales por los daños que está provocando en la salud mental a los menores. Y yo siempre transmito que pagar con datos es pagar. Y se están monetizando datos sensibles, datos especialmente protegidos de los menores e influyendo en sus comportamientos sin que las autoridades estemos, siendo, estemos pudiendo ser lo suficientemente proactivas para poder proteger ese acceso a contenidos inadecuados a los menores a edades tempranas. Los delitos sexuales violentos están aumentando y creo que es algo que debería estar dentro de nuestro propio análisis de riesgo como autoridades reguladoras, dentro de las prioridades en, en nuestro ámbito de actuación. Tengo algunos datos que son preocupantes. El Centro de Investigación Económica Regna Fritz de Estados Unidos ha publicado un estudio reciente, el coeficiente intelectual de la gente joven está bajando entre 2,5 y 4 puntos cada 10 años, así como el índice de lectoescritura. Y esto es algo que debemos hacer entre familia, industria y reguladores para prevenir, detectar y tratar cuando se están produciendo estos accesos inadecuados. Estamos trabajando en la Agencia Española en criterios para verificación de la edad, para precisamente garantizando la privacidad de los adultos, poder dar ese certificado, ese atributo de que eres mayor de edad, pero poder blindar que menores no accedan a contenidos que no serían apropiados para el desarrollo de su personalidad. Y el segundo punto, y ya voy a ser muy breve, eh, Trevor, es todo el tema de los neurodatos y la neurotecnología. Va a intervenir a lo largo de esta semana Rafael Juste, que es una eminencia, es la persona encargada por Obama para dirigir el proyecto BRAIN. Y ahora mismo, a nivel científico, los científicos ya pueden leer todas nuestras conexiones conscientes, las inconscientes también, y modificar nuestras conexiones neuronales. Esto implica que a nivel científico ya se puede influir en lo que pensamos, lo que sentimos, lo que decidimos y cómo nos comportamos. Esto en manos de la ciencia tiene unas posibilidades tremendas de desarrollo para el tratamiento de tetraplegia, problemas de trauma, etc. Pero en manos de determinadas compañías o gobiernos totalitarios, nunca hasta ahora la humanidad ha tenido un riesgo tan alto y tan grave como el que tenemos ahora. Y Rafael, a través de la Fundación NeuroRights, está eh, promoviendo que se, en la Declaración de los Derechos Humanos de Naciones Unidas se consagren los nuevos neuroderechos. No hay derecho más importante que el derecho a la privacidad mental, el derecho a la identidad mental, el derecho a que nadie pueda influir en lo que sentimos y lo que decidimos. Y lo quiero apuntar también porque creo que esto debería ser también un tema prioritario para todas las autoridades que formamos parte de la Conferencia Internacional. Gracias. Commissioner, thank you, gracias. Uh, gosh, what uh, a broad array of issues that we've highlighted. I've been taking some notes. I'm just going to run through them quickly. Um, I, I, Naomi got us started with a description of the NIST process and developing a framework for assessing risk and how ideas like embarrassment, which I want to dive into a bit because it's such an inchoate or ephemeral topic, how do you measure risk or harm in an area like embarrassment. We talked about the importance of harm and the recognition of vulnerability. Um, Commissioner España just raised issues of children and their particular vulnerability and whether that raises higher risk. Certainly it does. Um, it wasn't mentioned, but I also want to put on the table the idea of both individual and societal risks. What are we measuring for? Is it just an individual assessment, or do we have broader interests at stake? We also have questions of who decides? Who holds the measuring stick that determines risk? Is it the organization? Is it the individual, the data subject? Is it the regulator? I think there are important questions for us to understand there. And I also uh, particularly liked um, Commissioner Talus uh, telling us that fundamental rights are not negotiable, but the next word that she said was, but, but. And I think it, it suggests that there, there does need to be an assessment of risk in a world of limited resources where the digital economy is so prevalent and so many issues are presented uh, all at once. 
Um, I think there is a question for us to tackle there, which is how do we allocate our limited resources in the best way to the best effect? So we have our work cut out for us in the next 35 or so minutes. I'm actually going to start with Commissioner Talus. Um, can you help us understand risk management and mitigation within GDPR? How, how does it interact with a parallel focus of fundamental rights? How, how does the recognition of fundamental human rights being non-negotiable exist at the same time as a risk management approach? Is there not a friction between those two things? And, and can they live simultaneously within p one piece of legislation or regulation like the GDPR? Well, um I do think that they can live uh, side in side. Um, well, to repeat, that I do also think that the fundamental rights, they are non-negotiable. But then we have the technical and uh, organizational uh, structures uh, where we have the possibility to decide and choose from different, uh, uh, different options. So there is where we have the risk-based approach, and this is where we can uh, implement uh, the, the risk-based um, uh, approach. Not every processing of personal data contain uh, similar uh, risks, and this is uh, where, uh, where the balancing must take uh, place uh, when, when deciding on the technical and uh, organizational uh, uh, measures uh, uh, to take to mitigate the risk. And what we do uh, in TDBB, uh, we provide guidance to help uh, assessing uh, these risks. And uh, <clears throat> what we also do is that uh, we, for example, have uh, 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 certain targeted uh, uh, enforcement action, actions, uh, coordinated uh, enforcement actions based, uh, based also uh, on the assessment uh, of how risky the processing is. For example, uh, two years ago, uh, we had the coordinated uh, enforcement action focused on, to, on the use of uh, cloud uh, in the public sector. So this is uh, one way we can also uh, take the risk-based uh, risk approach uh, into account uh, in our work. Excellent. Um, so let's go then, so, I guess to, to reframe that or, or, or just to, to capture this idea, fundamental human rights are fundamental human rights and they are non-negotiable. However, the, the amount of risk that a particular activity may raise will determine the appropriate response, the appropriate tool, the, the appropriate mechanism to manage that risk. It doesn't change the fact that, that a fundamental human right sits at the base of, uh, of that assessment. There are non-legislative, non-fundamental human rights risks, however. Um, Naomi mentioned one, which is embarrassment. And embarrassment is probably not legislated in, in many places, in many ways. I'm sure it has um, uh, formulations in some laws around the world, but there are also risks to organizations that are non-legislative. And the NIST framework, it would seem to me, um, would uh, um, incorporate or accommodate the inclusion of legislative regulatory compliance risks, but also be more expansive than that as well. Namia, can you explain a little bit about that work at NIST and why such tools are important for organizations? Why do they need that systematized risk management approach as they are tackling data issues and privacy issues? Um, yeah. Happy to talk about that. So, and again, I think it's important to understand as, as, you know, another way to say non-legislative is that these are voluntary tools. And, um, and it's, I think it's important to understand the NIST approach to that, which is, um, you know, we think that they need to be used by a wide, or we would like them to be used by as wide a range of organizations as possible um, in all sectors. Uh, and in, in order to do that, um, and, and because they are voluntary, they, they have to be helpful. Um, otherwise, no one's going to use them. So, uh, so we run these very open, public, transparent processes um, where we try to gather as much um, input as possible through various um, modes, from workshops to public comments on documents um, before we come out with um, it's not even a final version, right? We consider these living documents that we update from time to time. Uh, and so, so just to sort of understand that background is important um, because 
you know, we recognize um, how important it is to address flexibility. Uh, so, you know, agree that, you know, we have these, you know, basic um, fundamental rights or civil liberties, as you might call them in the U.S., um, but, uh, you know, how do you, how do you implement that and how do you adjust that? I mean, you know, when you walk outside your door, right, you are negotiating privacy, right? So we are always uh, negotiating privacy in our lives between individual uh, rights and, and sort of societal needs. Uh, and so this is where, you know, risk management can really help and having a framework that provides that sort of consistency. And we, we've seen this now with organizations who said, you know, large multinational organizations who say, we use the privacy framework because it helps us build sort of a foundational program that we can then tailor to different jurisdictions. Um, and we've also seen very small or, uh, you know, organizations with not very mature privacy programs say, well, we use it as a starting point to help us organize and think about the things that, you know, we need to have in our program. Um, so, so there, and, and then the final point is that everyone also really likes it as a communication tool um, because, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, both inside the organization, right, because privacy risk management is something that has to, it's not just for the privacy program, the IT program, senior executives, everyone has to be involved in privacy risk management. Um, and then you can use it as a communication tool with, you know, your service providers um, or, uh, you know, or other organizations to sort of have that communication. This is our priorities. You know, are you going to be able to help us meet our priorities? Or here's how we can help you meet your priorities, right? Um, so it can be used for by organizations with different roles in the ecosystem. Um, and, you know, again, potentially it can be used even with regulators to say this is how we organized our program. These are the measures that we are taking to meet the requirements of the role, the law or the regulation. Um, so, so those are some of the sort of very key points about the, the frameworks and how they work. Excellent. Um, let's shift to what risk frameworks might miss. And I'm going to ask Marta Espana to respond to this. She mentioned appropriately, I think, the risks to children and the risk to mental health and how um, when social media was first introduced, much of our conversation was about privacy and data protection issues. Uh, we did not understand or perhaps even foresee the risks to mental health for particularly young girls associated with the use of social media. Let's use a historical context. When automobiles were first introduced, they really were understood to present um, safety risks, transport safety risks. And so there were speed limits and brakes and other things that were introduced. It wasn't for almost 100 years that the environmental concerns associated with the use of internal combustion engines and, and exhaust and the associated health issues and environmental issues uh, were really understood. How, how do we accommodate for what risk-based frameworks cannot see? How do, we, how do we know that we are capturing risks appropriately and leaving flexibility in these systems for future risks that cannot be understood or seen today? Commissioner. Eh, muchas gracias. Eh, creo que es una muy buena pregunta y que para poder hacer una buena eh, análisis y evaluación de riesgos es fundamental aplicar dos principios básicos del Reglamento General de Protección de Datos, que es privacidad por defecto y desde el diseño. Ese análisis de riesgo tiene que hacerse antes de empezar a realizar ese tratamiento de datos. Algo tan sencillo como comentaba Trevor, si una red social realiza un buen análisis de riesgo y una verificación adecuada de la edad, vamos a evitar muchos problemas, por ejemplo, a posteriori. ¿no? Voy a poner ejemplos que todos vais a entender de la vida diaria. Ninguno montaríamos un negocio sin haber hecho un análisis de riesgos de cuáles son nuestras bases financieras, eh, los posibles ingresos, etc. O si decides tener un hijo con una pareja y no haces un análisis de riesgos, muchas veces puedes tener unas consecuencias que luego acarreas ¿no? durante toda tu vida. Estamos haciendo análisis de riesgo a diario en nuestra vida personal, en nuestra vida profesional y en nuestra vida como organización. 
Y este análisis de riesgos no, se, no, se, no es un análisis estático, que se hace al principio y ahí nos quedamos. No, es imposible. Es un análisis que tiene que ser repetitivo, continuo, periódico y tiene que tener, es como un junco, como un bambú, tiene que tener flexibilidad y debe realizarse de manera periódica que implica una mirada transversal con medidas organizativas, medidas técnicas, medidas de, de seguridad, que salten alertas si cambia la legislación, si hay nuevas amenazas, una posible quiebra de seguridad o ha cambiado la propia estructura de la organización, entonces hay que volver a revisar. Tiene que ser algo con la suficiente fortaleza, pero al mismo tiempo con la suficiente flexibilidad para poder adaptarse a un mundo en el que ya estamos viendo, con la inteligencia artificial generativa, con los neurodatos, está creciendo a un ritmo mucho más rápido el que quizás todos podamos asumir y por eso este análisis de riesgo debe ser eh, continuo y periódico. It's excellent. So many great points there to capture. Um, one particularly is that a risk assessment is not a point in time assessment, rather it is an ongoing tool that you need to revisit often. Now one might then ask, well, how often is enough? When do you revisit? What is the, what is the cadence of, of your risk assessment and for what practices? And, and in some ways that's associated with the risk as well, isn't it? The higher the risk, one might imagine, the more often that you might want to be visiting um, uh, and, and performing risk assessments. Um, Let's now shift to the data protection authority environment because DPAs as well manage risk. They assess risk. They prioritize their activities. DPAs are notoriously understaffed and underfunded, under-resourced, and have to allocate their, um, their scarce resources in ways that have the most effect but also respond to the greatest risk. So Emma, perhaps you can help us understand uh, for a small office like yours, how does that happen? What does risk assessment look like for a data protection authority when you're assessing all of the various things that you're responsible for? Well, well as an office that really started from scratch in 2018, the first question that we have to ask ourselves is how do you allocate resources? It's exactly what you just said. You're yep. sitting with a blank sheet of paper and saying, do you have an entire team of investigators that are responding to complaints? Do you have an entire team of comms, uh, or what's the balance look like? That's the very first, uh, it sounds obvious, but it's an important question for all regulators, regardless of size, and we're a tiny office, but we have the same questions to answer. Um, and, I, and I really want to just emphasize that I, we always think about risk in terms of harms and vulnerabilities as well, so this is sort of a wrapped up in, our, in the language that we use. Uh, so the allocation of resources and how, and how we want to manage the staff and, what sort of, and actually what sort of people we want to have uh, on the ground as well. And then it's sort of more practical, more operational, how we assess breaches, how we handle complaints. And I think there was a point yesterday from the, the Canadian Commissioner about how we can use uh, breaches and complaints to give out positive and constructive messages around learning. Mm. We try and do that a lot because it's all very well. I mean, sanctions uh, and public statements um, are, are there to punish, but they're also there. They should also be there to show other people what not to do. So trying to be really clear about some of the things that have gone wrong, and maybe there's some of the things that, that controllers can do to prevent them from going wrong. Um, proactive inquiries is open to, to regulators as well when they see a particular area where they're, that they're concerned about. Um, and, and I want to mention a story that I think was only in the paper today um, that highlights one of the risks that we need to be mindful of is, is the risk uh, that, that trust is lost in the system more broadly. There was a story today where in, in the UK, uh, I think it's called the UK Biobank, where thousands of people have, have, have opted in, have, have consented to giving their uh, samples to this bank for medical research, but it's been stalled because of privacy concerns. Now, the optics of that, I don't know the details, forgive me, but the optics of that just, again, puts data protection and privacy people um, in the naughty corner with the general public. So this, this loss of trust is really important, I think, for us to understand. And I do want to make an important point here in terms of the, the list of things that we say, we think of in the office, is that we mustn't forget that we are part of the risk picture as a regulator, okay? So in effective regulation, poorly managed regulation, regulatory capture, lack of independence, all of those things make us a risk. Okay, so we need to make sure that we're humble enough to understand and see that and have an answer for it. So, you know, we're alive to these things, we're thoughtful about these things, but I think we need to be careful in something I said at the, in my intro comments, because, you know, operationally, a lot of these uh, assessment of risks sits with the controller, 
Um, you, you mentioned it before, Trevor, that you know, who is best placed to be assessing these things? Well, sometimes regulators will think maybe it's not the controller. So the question then is who and how, and how do you resource that? Um, and I, but I also think, you know, going back to a point that Mar made about children, it's really important, and we have a statutory duty around children. But I do think vulnerability to risk goes way beyond age. It goes way, way beyond whether it's special category data or not. So that's what I mean about the sort of broadening our horizon and how we, how we uh, approach risk. It's complex, it's multifaceted in a way that today, I think it wasn't 10 years ago. Um, and I want to just, if I may, just give one example. Uh, th those uh, UK-ish based will be aware of the, the police service of Northern Ireland breach. I don't know if you, those of you are familiar with that a few months ago now. So the, the entire uh, HR database of police officers in, in the police service was, was disclosed, for want of a better word. It was, it was reported in, heavily reported in the media in the UK. Now, if you'd asked serving police officers the day before that breach, serving police officers in Northern Ireland, and those of you that know the politics of that place will know the complexities of life in that part of the world. Um, if you'd asked a serving police officer, what is the, your biggest risk tomorrow morning they probably would have answered, well, I check for it under, the, under my car. They would not have answered my HR department. So again, we need to stop sometimes and think, well, what does risk actually look like? And what are we doing about it? Because the, the under the car is, in a sense, the easy risk to look for. The disclosure of HR data from your own employer, which yeah. potentially puts your life at risk for the rest of your life. Right. It, makes, it should make us stop uh, and think. And, and if I may... Um, want to continue the analogy that, that Alex has started with the water. Um, I, I have to be honest, I sometimes feel that as regulators that we're working really hard to, to help people uh, you know, shore up their flood damaged properties, to, to scoop out flood waters, um, shift sandbags to try and prevent the water from coming back. And we can do that really well. We can do that with real integrity. We really want to help them. But it's the leaking dam up the road that's the problem. And that's what we need to be looking at. Mm. So it's not that the individual homeowners don't deserve our attention, don't deserve our care. Um, they do, but just unless and until we fix the dam, we're yeah. just going to have to keep throwing resources. So looping back to your point about resources, we can just keep tooling up regulators. Yeah. Or we can take a moment to say, well, what, is, what does it actually look like to make meaningful outcomes uh, in this? Um, and because can you think of any other regulatory arena where we are so preoccupied with post-event harms and post-event damage? Um, uh, there was a quote, uh, forgive me, I can't remember who said it, some great speakers yesterday, that, that the innovation doesn't wait. Well, I beg to differ, because if you think about medicines and drugs, uh, aviation, those of us on the plane the other night, we were delayed, um, and it was really annoying, but if, if you said to me, there's a bit on that plane, you're about to fly over the Atlantic for seven hours, there's a bit on that plane that's not quite right. You are right with that? I'd have said no, <laughs> thanks. So I'd, I'm happy with the delay, right? So innovation does wait and can wait. The question is, who is asking it to wait, and if we're not asking it to wait, should we? Um, so we need to engage with harm and risks, I think, a little bit differently. Uh, you know, we're good. I'm good at engaging with a plane harm, right, or a drugs harm. Yeah. We're not so good at dealing with ephemeral risks and harms, I think. Um, and the data is seen as ephemeral. Um, and, you know, we've talked about, you mentioned it before, about um, mental health of, of children and young people. Can you imagine if those harms were physical? How would we react? And I would, I would suggest that we would react differently. Why? Because we need to be able to answer, well, if we react differently for that, but the impact is as great in this context, why aren't we doing more? Fascinating. So many great things to dive into there. Um, I, I, I think the, the distinction of cause v. symptom is, uh, is, is certainly relevant. Um, the idea of... of Privacy, data protection harms often being inchoate, ephemeral, difficult to assess and quantify. I think that's one of the great challenges in our field is that it is not easy to always see the harm, um, uh, either in a quantifiable monetary amount or a demonstrable sort of recognition of harm. It's, it's not like a physical injury um, often in our space. Uh, we deal with harms of dignity and pride and, um, and integrity of your data and embarrassment and other things that, that have um, a tendency to be um, a, a bit more challenging to assess and manage. L let's, let's focus on something, and Emma, you've just raised this. Anu, I'm going to ask you this question. As we are doing risk assessments, 
when do we say that a risk is too high? Um, Emma mentioned that, that there was a, a statement previously that innovation doesn't wait, and yet there are circumstances in other industries, other fields, aviation, consumer products, pharmaceuticals, where a consumer safety, a product safety approach would say that, no, something doesn't go to market unless it can actually be proven to be safe and beneficial for those in the market. Um, it would seem that in data protection, we have a slightly different approach, which is that um, largely within the boundaries of legislation, things are permissible, and we assess risk on an ongoing basis. When do we when do we say it's too much? When has it gone over a line that is too far? And we say, no, this must be stopped. Well, this was for me. OK, thank you. Uh, well, um, I think this is a good bridge to AI. And yeah. uh, we have actually addressed this topic uh, within the EDBB. We issued a, a joint opinion uh, with the EDPS. On, on the Commission's proposal uh, on the AI Act. And here we did uh, uh, highlight uh, uh, some situations where we actually do think that the risk uh, would be too, uh, too high. Um, this, um, uh, for example, um, uh, we did um, underline in our, uh, in our um, opinion that there should be a ban on the use of remote biometric identification in publicly accessible areas. So this is where we saw that the risk would be so high that it should not be allowed. So this, I think, would provide one example where we are reaching that type of risk that it would be very difficult to mitigate that with the yeah. So a, a great example, in the EU AI Act, currently under negotiation, and it's understood to be in the trilogue process, one of the issues that is contested, not entirely uh, uh, having full agreement yet, is an idea of a ban on biometric identification systems, particularly facial recognition systems. So there's one um, that where we say that technology has societal consequences that are too high. Naomi. Help us understand in the NIST framework or just generally, how do you quantify and assess some of these inchoate harms? How do you, what is the measuring stick for this? What does it look like in the NIST framework? What, how should practitioners out there that are doing risk assessments and trying to mitigate, how should they be measuring these harms when often they are very challenging to assess? Yeah, so that's why we developed the privacy risk assessment methodology. So we use um, what is in NIST parlance a semi-quantitative approach um, where you can score, um, you know, so first you sort of assess and map that system and sort of try to understand what are some of the issues that, you know, the different uh, operations that you're taking with data um, are creating. And so you might say, well, um, people didn't anticipate that this information would be revealed, and so some of them might find that embarrassing. And so you would sort of score that and say, what's the likelihood that you know our population of you know that will be using the service um, might feel embarrassed about some of this information? And you can just you know bucket it. You know we use a one to ten score, which is you know just. You know, it's, an inter it's not a external sort of two plus two equals four. It's something that organizations just do internally and sort of try to figure out. Um, we've had some organizations very interestingly have uh, different roles you do the scoring. So like a lawyer, a privacy program, and like an IT person or something, and then see like if they're, you know, really have a discussion where the scores might vary a lot. And mm. that, you know, engenders a conversation in the organization. Um, and so then, you, you know, you just come out with this score uh, and, um, and, 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 all, and, you know, and then we have this, the impact side, right? Because a risk model is, you know, likelihood times uh, impact. And so, you know, then you say, well, what's the impact if we create this embarrassment? And, you know, that's the harder one, right? right? Because, you know, people experience embarrassment very differently, right? Like some people are just like, eh, that's not great, but whatever. <laughs> Other people like don't want to leave their apartment and face their neighbors, yeah. right? So, so we have sort of, you know, 
you can certainly try and you can use research, right? And as we increase our research capabilities, that's something that organizations should look to to be like, how do we think people will react? Um, but we also have sort of proxies of, you know, organizational impacts. Like if we did embarrass people, like what would that do to our reputation? Or will people not want to use our products? Or, you know, mm. will we have non-compliance costs? Or uh, internal culture costs, right? Like yeah. we've seen in the US, like employee walkouts, right? So, um, so you can use that and you can score that too. And ultimately, you know, we have different manifestations, but many people use our heat map. So you can see like, whoa, these risks are going into the red and yeah. these are the yellow and these are green. And so you help prioritize. Because as you said, you know, I've yet to meet an organization that has unlimited resources. Um, so, so these are the ways that you can actually sort of make it more substantive. And the one final point I would make on this is, you know, you were sort of saying like, you know, how like we have these other areas where we, you know, test things and 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 you know, it's not impossible to do that. You know, it's never going to be perhaps as precise as, you know, here's what we know about dumping pollution into a river and how many parts it's going to take before fish die, right? But, but we do have the ability, and this is why we put into the privacy framework in our sort of communicate function, you know, more feedback mechanisms, more reliance on research, right? You, you know, every company I know does a lot of focus groups and product, you know, on, their, on how their products are going to be used and received. You know, why not put into that some privacy focusing group? You know, right. like, like right. How, do, how will our, you know, people receive this from a privacy perspective? Um, and so we will never be perfect, um, you know, unless you're just not going to do the thing, then, you know, you can't avoid all risk. Um, but you could, you know, try to mitigate it down to, you know, a acceptable level. And, you know, this is as a former regulator at the Federal Trade Commission, I've now come to realize that regulators are in some ways arbiters of acceptable levels of risk. Mm. Right? And so, so they will sort of decide, like, what is the acceptable residual level of risk? Interesting. So I, I want to capture a few things that Naomi said here because I think they're helpful. Um, Many organizations will use a risk register structure. They'll use tools that will help them assess risk. You assess the likelihood of risk. You assess the impact of risk. Um, you assess the effectiveness of the mitigations that you might put in place, and that gives you a residual risk. There are residual risks that you have to accept because there's no other, there's no other answer. Um, there are residual risks that you can stack rank and assess resources against in order to manage and mitigate beyond that. I do want to just dive in and not let you off the hook, um, Naomi, on, on how challenging it is um, to assess the impact of some of these circumstances. When we are looking at risk, particularly in privacy and data protection, you're absolutely right to mention that we often talk about individuals because different individuals may have different understandings or perceptions of their own levels of embarrassment or harm that might occur. Um, but it is also contextual. Different individuals will have different contexts of risk in a workplace, at home, on the street. It is also culturally normative. Different cultures and, and countries around the world, different cultures within countries can have different normative expectations of what is, um, what is harm or what is problematic when it comes to use of their data violation of privacy or data protection. All of that creates this enormously complex risk environment to assess impacts. Um, and so I will let you off the hook. I won't make you answer that, but I don't but I, I think okay, <laughs> please do. So so how do you how do you navigate that complexity? What does that look like? Because it seems to me that is the most complex matrix of risks that one might imagine. Um, yeah. Well, I remember once um, you know somebody at uh, I went to a dinner and um, it was like the head of privacy for Microsoft, and he said, you know, risk management requires creativity and intelligence. And, okay. and, and so the quality of the people that you have, the uh, workforce, is critical, right? Yeah. So, you know, you talk about individuals, but the framework, our risk assessment can be used at individual level, at the group level, at the societal level, because now we have, maybe we didn't 
think hard enough or try to understand the risks initially to children, for example, but now we do. And so as you know, we've been hearing risk is not, risk assessment is not static. So now this information should be folded in to the products that are being developed. And it's not, it shouldn't be acceptable to say, oh, I didn't know that this would harm children because now we have this um, research. Um, and that should be part of the um, ongoing changes to existing products, as well as inputs into the development of future products and services. Excellent. Well done. Good answer, by the way. Um, <laughs> I'm going to come back to a point that you made. But let me turn to Mar. Um, and uh, Anu raised uh, AI. And of course, I, I, I feel like when we're talking about risk, at this moment in time, we have to mention AI and, and the risks associated with AI that are emerging. Interestingly, when we look at the EU AI Act, when we look at laws around the world, there is a very clear legislative direction, a policy direction that risk management approaches are the right policy tools currently for addressing AI. Certainly, data protection, discrimination, and other well-formed areas of law intersect and interact with, with AI policy significantly. But with AI um, legislation as it exists in the EU AI Act, in C27, in Canada, and many of the frameworks around the world, risk management appears to be the favored mechanism to manage AI. Tell us about that. Is, is that right, or are there fundamental rights implications that we should be capturing? And what about those unknown risks that you so rightly raised for us, Mara, before? How are we to know that we aren't approving or allowing technologies to roll into the marketplace, particularly with AI, that may have very severe consequences for us ultimately? Yeah. Eh, es una pregunta eh, crucial. Vivimos en un momento crítico con la irrupción de las nuevas tecnologías, sobre todo con la inteligencia artificial generativa. Y yo siempre planteo, la privacidad en muchas ocasiones para las organizaciones es como la salud para las personas. No la valoramos hasta que la perdemos. Y cuando ya se pierde, hay una brecha de seguridad o hay un problema, es cuando el CEO de la organización se echa las manos a la cabeza. La inteligencia artificial puede ser una gran herramienta a la hora de evaluar y mitigar los riesgos, pero siempre tiene que ir complementada por el, un buen equipo dentro de la organización que conozca, que complemente esa estructura de la organización, ese funcionamiento interno. Hay muchas cosas que se palpan a nivel sensitivo, que eso no nos va a poder dar nunca la inteligencia artificial. Y esa sensibilización, ese conocer dónde, dónde puede haber el área de la empresa ¿no? más vulnerable, eso es algo que va a tener que tener siempre un complemento humano. Y igual que las personas, hay diferentes personas y diferentes apetitos de riesgo. Hay personas muy conservadoras que invierten sus ahorros a plazo fijo, hay otras que están dispuestas a perderlo todo con tal de tener mayores ganancias. Sí, yo creo que en el ámbito de las autoridades de protección de datos, los organismos reguladores, debemos tener un apetito de riesgo bajo y lanzar esa seguridad y esas herramientas de confianza al mercado. Y eso implica, desde luego, una mirada transversal, eso implica la flexibilidad de poder utilizar la inteligencia artificial, pero siempre con el complemento humano, porque si no, un, un riesgo ya, de hecho, es si solo el análisis de riesgo se basa en una inteligencia artificial. Ahí ya va a haber mmm, un fallo, porque seguro que hay temas muy sutiles, muy profundos, donde la inteligencia artificial, que aprende a base de errores también, no ha podido llegar. ¿no? Entonces, sí a utilizarlo, pero siempre con ese complemento humano y siempre teniendo en cuenta que tenemos que hacer ese análisis de riesgo valorando también el impacto en las minorías, en las personas que pueden tener un mayor riesgo precisamente pues, eh, por un análisis de riesgo defectuoso. Excelente. Creo que tus puntos son muy bien Mar, particularmente la idea de que también que reconocer que hay are communities, populations, which are more vulnerable, um, and, and they deserve particular protections as well. We have come to the end of our time. I want to highlight just a few things as we wrap up our panel. Um, first, that it is very clear 
that risk management is not a point in time solution. It is not a, a mechanism that you can execute once, you can do once, and then it's done and, and you put it on a shelf. No, rather, um, you need highly qualified people that are doing ongoing work and managing risk for an organization, for a data protection authority over time. Um, when you are assessing risk man, uh, matters, um, before implementation, during implementation, after a risk event has occurred, all of those are important uh, times to be assessing risk. The, the, the occurrence of risk absolutely is a factor, the likelihood that a risk may occur, um, but the effect of risk or the, um, the consequences of a risk and, and consequences to whom um, actually can have an enormous effect on the decisions that you take from a risk management approach. And ultimately, I wanna come back to something that Naomi said, uh, because from where I sit, I think it's one of the most important points, and that is the quality of the people. Uh, we need people who do this work. We need people who do this work inside regulatory authorities. DPAs need qualified people. They are understaffed and under-resourced, and they need great people to do incredibly important work. Um, organizations need qualified people to do the work of, of this risk management so that these approaches can be effective. And I think uh, this panel has shown us something, and that is that the quality of people here on the stage is a great example of what we can aspire to when we think of effective risk management approaches in the marketplace today in our digital economy. So please join me in thanking these experts. Thank you.